Welcome to this video on Babinet's principle for scattering and absorption. What we're going to do today is get a basic introduction to the geometry of scattering and absorption. And we'll find that diffractive scattering and absorption are not completely independent processes. So the last time we saw scattering was in the context of the radiative transport equation, which said that the change in specific intensity with respect to the distance through a medium is equal to the emissivity of that medium minus the extinction of the background light through that medium. And we said that that extinction coefficient could be modeled as a number density of absorbers times a cross-section for absorption, which I'll write as sigma abs here. And we'd also talked about scattering, and we decided that we could put that inside of the emissivity term and say that our emissivity is the number density of scatterers times the cross-section for scattering times some angle average background light, which we call J bar. So basically, we hid everything about the geometry and the absorptivity or reflectivity of our scatterers inside these two coefficients, these cross sections for absorption and for scattering. And what we're going to do right now is try to look at those in more detail and see if there are some relationships between the cross sections. So the first thing we should probably do is, is write down a geometric cross section. So I'll just write that sigma with no subscript here. And we'll just define that to be pi a squared, where a is the radius of our scatterer. Why did we use a and not r? I don't know, but a is what we usually use. And now we need something like a coefficient that can turn our geometric cross-section into, for example, a, a cross-section for absorption. So we could say that sigma abs is equal to some coefficient q abs times sigma. And similarly, we could define a coefficient for scattering, q scat. So you can imagine these as being some scalar that can take our geometric size of our object, our scatterer or absorber, and take into account things like what it's made of, what color it is, how big it is with respect to the incoming radiation. And these coefficients scale the geometric cross-section because generally the coefficients for absorption and scattering should depend on the geometric size of our scatterer or absorber. So now let's do a thought experiment. Suppose I've got some background light here that is a plane wave propagating in this direction. And I'm going to introduce my scatterer or absorber over here. And then as a function of angle, I want to know how much of this radiation coming in at this plane wave gets past this particle and ends up on a screen over here that's effectively very far away. So far that we can neglect things like the curvature of the wave front coming off of this particle, which some people call the far field. Now before we go playing with this particle here, let me remind you of something. Let me remind you of what happens if we put a slit here with a plane wave coming in. Now what happens is some of the light gets through the slit, and after it gets through the slit, it radiates outward, but not as a plane wave, but as a circular wave front. And so what happens is that because on one side of the slit and on the other side of the slit, there are slightly different distances to any point on this screen over here at infinity, we get an interference pattern at this screen. And that interference pattern comes from the fact that at some place, like here at the peak, we have the same distance to either side of the aperture. And therefore, the wave fronts coming through this aperture, this slit in our screen over here, adds up in phase and we get a peak. But in other places, like over here, the difference in path length from one side of the aperture to the other side of the aperture, and these wave fronts from two sides of this aperture add up out of phase, canceling each other out. And what we end up is the interference pattern that actually ends up being the Fourier transform of our aperture. So in this kind of one-dimensional case here, you could think of this aperture as a function that is zero everywhere. It lets no light through. It lets through some light in this gap, and then it lets through no light everywhere else. And the Fourier transform of that square function is a sinc function, which is a sine x over x. And the wider I make this aperture, the narrower this interference pattern is going to be. And of course, because we're measuring light here, we're measuring power, not just the electric field. What we actually see on the screen is the square of this Fourier transform, so we see the square of sine x over x. All right, so that's our familiar slit experiment. 
And the question is, what does our slit experiment tell us about what's going to happen in this case up here that we were just looking at, where we have a particle interacting with the plane wave coming in? Well, if this particle weren't here, what we'd get on the screen at infinity is a spike at theta equals zero and nothing elsewhere. Where that spike is actually a delta function and it represents the Fourier transform of this infinite plane wave. And all that we're saying here is that if there's no particle here to scatter off of, this plane wave just keeps going in the theta equals zero direction and arrives at the screen there. And nothing scatters off. There's no reason for this plane wave to change direction. Now before we consider what happens when I put the particle back here, let me do one other case. Let me do what happens if we have the opposite of a particle there. Now instead of putting a particle here, I'm going to put the opposite of a particle. The opposite of a particle is a barrier that blocks all the light except for the light that would have passed through the area where the particle existed. And as we already worked out, this is just a diffraction grating. It's our slit experiment, and we're going to end up with our sink function over here on the screen. All right, so if that's what the opposite of a particle is, what happens if I put the particle back in here? Well, here's the clever realization behind Babinet's principle. If I take all the light that gets past the particle in this case, it ends up hitting the screen on the back here. And I take all the light that made it through this complementary case where we have the opposite of a particle, a slit in our aperture, and I add these two cases together, I get all the light passing through my aperture, and this is the case that we already mapped out. If nothing is in my aperture, if I have all the light coming through, I'm gonna end up with a delta function on my screen. Now, Fourier transforms here, Fourier transforms are linear operations. That means if I apply a Fourier transform to two different functions and then add up the Fourier transforms, I get the same thing as if I Fourier transformed the sum of those two functions. Said mathematically, the Fourier transform of f plus the Fourier transform of g, two functions, is equal to the Fourier transform of f plus g. And what this means is that the Fourier transform of whatever we get here in the particle case, when added to the Fourier transform of what we got here in the slit case, is going to have to add up to this delta function right here. Which means that this function over here needs to be a delta function minus a sinc function. So here's our delta function, and it has to be minus our sinc function. Now our sinc function is going to be squared here on the screen. And the square of a negative sinc function is still a sinc function. So what we end up in the particle scattering case is just our same sinc function plus a delta function in the middle that carries the rest of the power of this plane wave that did not interact with our particle. Now this case that we were just describing here, the power that we get as a function of angle should be equal to our power in, our plane wave, times q abs for the power that was absorbed which could be a function of theta, times sigma, our geometric cross-section. And this other case that we just described here, the power pattern that we end up with is proportional to our input power, but it represents the radiation that interacted with where the particle geometrically was and still ended up on this screen. And this is precisely what a scattering event is. It can be angle-dependent, and of course it's still proportional to the geometric cross-section. Now, if this was the original E field in, now here I'm talking about electric field, not power, then we end up with some electric field here on the scattering screen. Power is proportional to E scat squared. Similarly, the power that ended up over here in the absorbing case, the electric field E abs, is related to the power that ends up on the screen as P is proportional to E abs squared. And of course, down here at the bottom, the original electric field just ends up on our screen. Now we knew from the linearity of these systems that E, being E in, is equal to E scat plus E abs. But for any angle except theta equals zero, the E that I end up with is zero. And that means that E scat is equal to negative E abs for theta not equal to zero. And that means that the power scattered in any direction 
because it's proportional to the square of these electric fields, has to be equal to the power absorbed in any theta direction. Which is to say that the radiation that is scattered off here, that appears here on the screen from the absorption case, has to be equal to what shows up there from the scattering case. And because P scat up here was just our power N times Q scat times the geometric cross section, and P abs down here is the same thing with our Q abs cross section, we have that Q scat is actually equal to Q abs. Again, for theta not equal to zero. And while this might seem reasonable on the surface, this is pretty strange. It's something that is actually called the extinction paradox. The essence of the extinction paradox is if I have a source of light and I put a big absorber in front of it, and this light has some flux, F, then if this is a perfect absorber here, this particle that I've put here, then I directly absorbed right here F times Q abs, which we're basically saying is 1, times our geometric cross section right there. So that energy didn't get any further than this particle. But we also know that some of the power diffracts around this object and also scatters. So we end up with some power out here. And the power that scattered is actually the same value as power that was absorbed, such that the total power that's missing here is twice as much as you might think. The total extinction is actually 2 times our original cross-section. Now this seems like a bit of a paradox because how are you missing twice as much power as what actually impacted your object? And the answer is, it's not that you're it's not that it's missing in the universe, it's just missing from you, the observer, right here, from far away. If you were close to this object, observing right here with your eye, then you'd be in the shadow of this object and you wouldn't be getting anything. But that isn't the situation we've set up here. The situation we've set up is one in which we are very far from this object and we see diffraction off of that object. So we see a diffractive shadow that goes out and it's this diffractive shadow that creates this interference pattern that we see over here. That's where the missing power is. It didn't go into your eye, it went somewhere else in the universe. We're missing right here from looking straight behind this object is missing twice as much light as you'd expect, once from the direct absorption of it and once from the diffractive scattering around the edges of that object. So this is the major upshot of Babinet's principle. It is that the coefficient for absorption, the absorption efficiency, is equal to the scattering efficiency in the geometric limit. And I should say that we define the geometric limit to be when 2 pi times the radius of our particle is significantly bigger than the wavelength of the light that we're looking at. They might ask, why the 2 pi here? And the answer is, when light is coming in, it can excite electrical currents back and forth across this grain here. And it's these currents that cause the absorption or the scattering. But the longest current that can be excited is actually around the edge of your scatter. And of course, the distance around the edge is 2 pi times a. So 2 pi a is the scale of the longest path length that a, for a current that can be excited by incoming light. The other upshot of Babinet's principle is that the extinction coefficient, which is light that's missing both from absorption and scattering, is twice as much as what you might think from just basic geometry that you lose your light twice, once when you directly absorb it and once when you diffractively scatter around your object. And just to remind you one more time, we're talking about the far field here. We have a source of radiation here, the plane wave coming in in this direction, and we have an absorptive object here, that we have diffractive scattering, and if you're nearby, like right behind that object over here, you might see that you're getting only absorption and not really any scattering effect. But if you get far enough away, that's why Babinet's principle is for the far field, then we'll see that we have a transmission spike for the light that goes around, and then we have a sink function, or in two dimensions, it'll be a Bessel function that represents the missing light that comes from the diffractive scattering. We talked about the extinction paradox, which is the fact that twice as much of the light is missing as you might think. And another kind of counterintuitive result here is that the larger this object is, the narrower the scattering distribution is. Which is to say that very large objects, like moons, although they block a lot of light, relative to their size, most of their light goes still pretty close to the original direction. 
it's just slightly diffracted. Whereas smaller objects, like dust particles, diffractively scatter much more isotropically. Which means that if you have a light source coming in on your object like here, and you're observing, and you're observing that object for an angle that's highly inclined from the radiation direction, you'll see that object better if it's a small particle than if it's a large one like a moon. And that's Babinet's principle as applies to diffractive scattering.